So I've got two cases that are both, you know, could be entire conferences on their own, I think. Both are multi-step cases, but I will show this one first. And this is a guy who is in his 50s and has a mixed connective tissue disease. This was his CT from, from a couple of years ago. He presented outside with worsening dyspnea over the course of months. And you can look at his lungs. We'll come back to his lungs in a second. I think the first thing you see is his pulmonary artery is large. And I, as I like to be specific, talking about pulmonary artery enlargement, notice it's larger than the aorta, which helps. And also he clearly has signs of pulmonary hypertension. His RV is dilated, it's, it's hypertrophied. And so this is one of those ones where they frequently will ask us, could this be pulmonary veno occlusive disease when they have an otherwise unexplained patient, right? The left heart chambers look fine. And on this CT, this was a PE protocol done elsewhere. There's a little bit of septal thickening, just kind of a diffuse increased grayness to his lungs maybe, and then some bronchial wall thickening. Some usually we see, or you think about effusions, lymphadenopathy, et cetera you know, not present on that one. This was a couple months later, and I think the findings, the left heart cath, there was a normal wedge pressure, or the right heart cath, normal wedge pressure. Still similar things. So certainly could be seen in the setting of pulmonary veno-occlusive disease, but not a slam dunk as far as, as I would be concerned. So he goes to transplant. He does, in fact, have pulmonary veno-occlusive disease. So that's part one of this. It's, I don't know, you guys, agree it's pretty you know not not a slam dunk based on this but clinically he behaved like that and it would certainly fit yeah i always struggle between when you have someone with really bad type 1 pah and you yep. get the blushing around the pulmonary arterioles that versus, kind of central lobular yes exactly versus yeah. this nodularity you see yep. in these cases of pch slash pvod we have a case very similar that went like this, that went to transplant, looked identical, and it was PC, PCH yeah. slash PVOD. I um, find myself often in these cases, just like if they ask, could it be PVOD? You say, yes, you know, yes. it could. Yeah. yeah uh, so, so then he goes to, then he goes to transplant. His transplant, you know, is complicated. As you see here, this is a, I don't remember, this is a couple months after transplant, complicated by sternal wound infection. So he undergoes debridement of a sternal wound. And there, I don't know what it grew, if it ever actually grew anything. So that was June. Then we can go forward to October. They've debrided things. Things look reasonable. Then this was April of this year. And now there's this new, what was called at the time, a new fluid collection in the retrosternal space, which I think you know, it is a fluid collection, but that was kind of all that was said at that time. And then this is the one I saw last week and took an extra look at this and it's getting a little bit bigger. But what I really didn't like is A, it's a budding the aorta and B, this calcification here is starting to look like it's a dis it's at a tangent, like a dis like tangential calcium, like you'd see with an aortic rupture in the abdomen. And you know, scrolling through this, I wasn't able to really see a wall Plus, I noticed that this right here, when you look back a couple of studies, it used to be over here. And I was wondering if this was some sort of the, the pledget or something where they cannulated. But to make a long story short, called him, told him I was worried about a pseudoaneurysm. And sure enough, there's a huge pseudoaneurysm with a fairly delayed presentation. You know, this um, fortunately hadn't ruptured, and it's interesting that the one of the reconstruction plate screws, at least one, and I'm not even sure what this thing is, some sort of suture is you know, involving this, and I'll show you on a sagittal. You can see it, it's interesting, like there's a thread, almost like this is a suture going through this, and I don't know exactly what it is. You can see the screw there. So because he had the prior infection, I don't, I wasn't crazy about the fact that they went to Angio to, to cover this. Uh, but that's the way they chose, just because I think there's probably some sort of an indolent infection in there. You can see on the, one of the final runs they did, there's still some filling of this after they put this in, but they're going to just observe and see. He was asymptomatic from this. It was just an incidental finding on a on on our just a post lung transplant follow up. So PVOD lung transplant sternal infection complicated by 
pseudoaneurysm dehiscence. This one, is David on here now? I don't know if David's, I don't, I can't see the list, but He's this on. is another one. This is, I see him on. Okay. Yes, I'm well, here. I'm here. All right. Was, well, this is, well, hopefully everyone will like this. It's not something we haven't seen before, but I think it's interesting just the way it played out. So this is a 28 year old female who presented a couple months before this to an outside hospital with tricuspid valve endocarditis from intravenous drug use. This is not at the time, and I have no imaging from there. I don't see any vegetations on her tricuspid valve, but at this point in time, she presented and was transferred with worsening fever, back pain, and we can see typical look for septic emboli with peripheral, or at least hematogenous infection, peripheral areas of consolidation. There's no cavitation in these. She had methicillin sensitive staph growing out of her blood. And I think here, when you get to this, it's the chicken versus the egg. She has an empyema right here. And her back pain though is more, I think, caused by the fact that she has discitis osteomyelitis and a huge paravertebral abscess in her lower thoracic spine. And I can show you this on sagittal. And you can see, so it's, it's actually involving two levels, but there's disc involvement in the destroyed vertebral body at this level. So typical of discitis osteomyelitis. So she undergoes spinal fusion and she, let's see, no, that's not the one. This is, this is right after spinal fusion and she's in the hospital for a couple of weeks and they send her home and she comes back last week with worsening dyspnea. And I don't know how well this shows up, but she has, now you can see she's got dyspnea and they- He's still injecting her. things, man. He's still huh? injecting. He's still injecting. Well, yeah, now they've given the avenue, right. You yeah. know where I'm going with this. Yeah, yeah it's beautiful. It's a nice chest x-ray, yeah. Yeah, so bunch of tiny nodules, you've got the pick. And then of course, now you have as good as we've seen with the diffuse central ovular nodules. And these are, you know, they're, if you want to say they're tree and bud, sure, but they're very discreet, much more discreet than we see with, you know, with hypersensitivity pneumonitis or, or often with airway centered things. And of course, like whenever they're diffuse and involve every secondary pulmonary lobule, and when you have new onset of pulmonary hypertension, big right heart, big pulmonary artery, her mean systolic pressure, pulmonary artery pressure was in the 50s. Yeah, that she was, and she eventually did confess to injecting. She said she only did it once. Uh -huh. You know, crushing up a tablet and doing it. So we have macros, you know, septic emboli evolving into or, or representing them with excipient lung disease. That's really nice. Yeah. So uh, I'll stop there. I know we have a lot of people on. All right. Thanks. That's great cases. All right. Who would like to go next? I, I can go you. quickly. Oh, Dave, do you want to go? That's fine. Yeah, let me, uh, let me go ahead. Okay, Dave. Um, so can people see a scalp view? Yep. yep. Okay, this is a woman uh, about 40 years old who uh, has a diagnosis of HIV and was on antiretroviral therapy and was, um, you know, was, was using the therapy regularly and stuff like that. She had, does have this consolidation here in her right mid lung and maybe some lymphadenopathy um, on uh, CT. She has a ton of lymphadenopathy, not just that right hilum, but lots of mediastinal stuff. And she's got this lung disease too with a um, collapse here of her middle lobe and some bronchiectasis. Okay, and then if we can follow down into the abdomen, we see that there's a lot of uh, abdominal lymphadenopathy too. So she's got peri-aortic lymphadenopathy all over the place. And some of this lymphadenopathy has low attenuation centers to it. Uh, not so much in the mediastinum, but there were some abdominal nodes that suggested low attenuation in the center, and that should raise the question of mycobacterial disease. Okay, and she had, um, I think she had a, uh, I think I can show you a, uh, a pet, um, a pet CT that she had, and this is all that lymphadenopathy lighting up, plus of a lot of abdominal lymphadenopathy lighting up too. So. Um, in terms of lung disease, she does have the middle lobe 
um, consolidation here with bronchiectasis. And the rest of the lungs look pretty good. So she had a uh, lymph node biopsy, uh, mediastinal lymph node fine needle aspiration, and she had lavage of her lungs, and they recovered Mycobacterium avium from both sites. So this is Mycobacterium avium disseminated, and presumably her lymphadenopathy in the abdomen is the same, has the same cause. So Mycobacterial avium complex here presenting with lymphadenopathy, and maybe the lung disease, maybe that is related to it as well, or maybe this is a good, good site to colonize, given that she's got some bronchiectasis, she's got bronchial abnormality there. So disseminated MAC in the setting of HIV. I don't think I've seen this. I've never not seen it, such dramatic lymphadenopathy before from MAC. Um, but this is a case like in the old days where we used to see a lot more MAC with uh, HIV. Okay. David, uh, large lymph nodes um, about the origin of right middle lobe bronchus, discernibly so. Um, right upper lobe, it's coated with lymphadenopathy. Middle lobe, middle here. lobe there. We're looking, looking for our middle lobe takeoff. Middle, just and it's compression of the middle lobe bronchus by nodal pathology. Yeah, I like that. So uh, primary here, I think the, the middle lobe stuff is oh, probably... Yes, yeah. it could be, couldn't it? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Okay, this person has a fine nodular lung disease, has a history of trauma, has had spinal fusion, and has this this very this very fine stippling throughout the lungs, and it wasn't there, say eight months ago, okay. And um, if we do a CT on it, we uh, should not be surprised to find that there are um, small nodules everywhere you look. And I think we had some nice MIPS, so MIPS are always great for small nodules. And um, here's the MIPSology. Oh. And this is probably unfamiliar to you guys. I don't think you've seen very many cases of this, and certainly not recently. But this is excipient lung disease. So, just between a day, two in one webinar. Yeah. So, it's out there. I mean, it's not as fashionable as vaping, but um, this is another way to um, get substances into the body here. So this guy checked out before he could be confronted with um, by the pulmonologist who was armed with the CT results was going to ask him questions. So he's he's gone, but um, and that's actually that's consistent with this disease, which is um, you know checking out AMA and not wanting to be asked a lot of questions. So I, I haven't reviewed his uh, pharmacy to see whether he had oxycodone tablets, but that's probably what he was prescribed. And you know, given all of his back surgery and history of trauma and stuff like that, he probably had very good reasons to have had a prescription for uh, painkillers before. Okay. Three. Was there yeah. something else? Yeah. That, that's, that's good. Okay. And then uh, this is a woman who came in this morning, um, and she has a problem with an issue here with scoliosis, for sure. It looks as if she's got a right lower lobe pneumonia with nice air bronchograms down there. Um, if we get a lateral view on her, we see that she has a severe pectus. So she has deformity of her spine, thoracolumbar scoliosis, and a very bad pectus. And, you know, if we look posteriorly, the lungs are, lungs are pretty clear down there, and she does have a CT. I'm going to have to reorient this here. Let me, I can rotate this here. Let's see, let's rotate it this way. Okay, so here's a CT scan that was done a few years ago, and it shows, um, we're, we're seeing the scoliosis, this is really abdominal CT, so that's all I have, but it does overlap the lung bases. There's not really much in the lung bases, and her um, radiographs from this era show the same right lower lobe pneumonia that we're seeing currently. Here's her very bad pectus, and it's really asymmetrical. And then she's had these implants, and the implants, I think, are they may have there may have been a cosmetic approach to a sort of filling up the defect too. That would be a reason to have uh, these prostheses in there. So 
So I've seen women before with this disease, and I think that they probably, it's probably cosmesis to have the implants help cover up the pectus problem. So this is really pectus pseudo-pneumonia. Again, this is the most, one of the most florid cases I've seen where it really looks as if there's disease down there with their bronchograms. So these lucencies, these radial lucencies are probably just spaces between vessels, but you know, my eye interprets the consolidation and then sees these lucencies and jumps to air bronchograms. And that, that makes this even more convincing as a pneumonia, whereas it's just pseudo pneumonia. So I'm not showing you her old radiographs that look just the same around the time that she had the CT scan, but take my word for it. Yeah. So you're, you're allowed to have pseudo pneumonia and pneumonia too. Um, I think you just have pseudo pneumonia. And then this uh, line here, which I, on some other radiograph looked superimposed over descending or I thought was aortic calcification is just part of the calcification of her implant in that right breast. Okay, those are the cases I wanted Great. to show. All right, thanks, David. Okay, uh, Seth? Uh, yeah, I can go. I'm sorry there for half a this is, I say this often, this is something I've never heard of before until this is actually was a physician who flew here for a CME conference and then as he was from the Caribbean and then as he was here, got quite ill um, and was in the hospital for only about two days and then died. Uh, and you can see there's this multifocal necrotizing pneumonia. Some of these other areas of consolidation are kind of have internal intralobular and intralobular septal thickening, kind of a crazy paving pattern. Um, and then what's, so I'll show you the belly, which is interesting. So his belly, you can see that he has these scattered hepatic lesions and, um, his blood cultures grew out Klebsiella. So they both got Klebsiella, both from bronchoscopy and from uh, his blood cultures. And there's something I've never heard of. I, I'm, I'm gonna screw up the name, but it's basically a syndrome, which is not really a syndrome, basically caused by Klebsiella sepsis, where you get hepatic abscesses and multifocal pneumonia, and it's extraordinarily fulminant and toxic and leads to death in about 30% of patients. So this was some form of, this was a Klebsiella infection. Um, again, I, I'm not good at naming bugs, nor whatever attributed this Klebsiella, but there's some thing that, or some quote unquote syndrome, which is a disseminated infection associated with hepatic abscesses and fulminant necrotic Klebsiella pneumonia. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of that before, but it's like yeah. I-M-P-K-A-S, what? So Seth, is the idea that, that the liver abscesses seeded the blood and that's how well, it that's got that's the, the question. That's the question. And, and I think his, that supposedly um, that's a thought. And I, a lot of the cases, like the biggest ones come from China or has, they have like a paper with like 80 cases, which is odd. Um, but they show cases where there's one dominant abscess here. There's one predominant dominant abscess in the posterior segment here, but there's lots of other lesions. So I think the underlying theory is that the liver abscess seeds the, the blood in the lung, but I'm not sure in this case, given that it's so multifocal. Hmm. But if you look at Klebsiella on liver, liver abscess, there, there is a actual um, known thing that occurs with it. Again, uh, quite odd. Uh, this is something else that is, uh, these are just odd cases. So this is a guy who comes in, uh, HIV, severely immunocompromised, has this, uh, I would other call it besides a miliary pattern, there's really no clear distribution of these nodules. Now, what's weird about it being a miliary pattern is usually I ascribe miliary patterns to being uh, hematogenous spread. And you would assume that if it's hematogenously distributed, that it would in fact be lower low predominant because that's where most of your blood flow is. Uh, but this is strikingly has an upper lobe predominance and some relative lower lobe sparing or lower lung sparing. Uh, the patient had multiple uh, sputum cultures that were positive for AFB. 
uh, everything else was negative. Silverstein was negative. He was treated. So you can see he has, he, he had like known immune system. Uh, you can see he has some of these little cystic areas. They started treating him with immune reconstitution therapy after uh, this study and his diagnosis of tuberculosis. And what's fascinating is what happened to this over a short period of time. So this is now a few days later, um, literally just a few days later, and he's developed what is just extensive. And I showed before a case of um, DAD turning into some sort of emphysematous uh, process. And this is some sort of cystic destruction of the lung. If it's emphysema or not, I'll show you what has happened. You can see there's some internal architecture and in some of these others don't. They've led to a pneumothorax. We still have some of these background nodules. Now he has more fulminant consolidation at the bases. He's obviously not doing very well. And then this is, you can see the date. So that was 9.16 to 9.27. And this is now five days after that. And there's just extensive destruction of the lung with the cystic change, where you start seeing that some of these are emphysematous spaces. Um, others are probably just areas of lung necrosis, but a lot of them have internal architecture, which makes me think it's, it's emphysema. So patient died, um, no autopsy was performed, but this was presumed TB. Again, everything was, all, everything was positive for TB that during the treatment somehow developed this bizarre emphysema or cystic change that then obviously led to pneumothorax because something ruptured has, uh, I, I don't even know if, how to explain that one, but you can just see the progression from this miliary stuff within two weeks to just advanced destruction of the lung. Wow. Well, so uh, there was no, there was no pneumocystis. I mean, it would be no, I asked him that. I asked him, I said, multiple times that like, dude, they, they've bronked this guy four times and not, there was never pneumocystis. Got it. Like it was florid. T I asked him the same thing. It was florid TB or florid, you know, mycobacteria that was eventually came back as TB and no, nothing on the silver stain, but I still don't understand how it's, why it's not lower low predominant. Is it some sort of <laughs> airway spread? Yeah, I was going to say, I, recognize that before with TB and I wonder if it's the oxygen tension you know the same thing that you see with uh, just where it develops in the airways I don't know what you guys I was thinking that this could be little airway abscesses and micro abscesses in the airways and this is predominantly even though it's miliary kind of appearance it's most predominantly an airway spread of a, a disease and that but I'm kind of stretching I, I don't I'm having trouble on explaining this one but it's it's again quite interesting uh and this I, I don't know if i showed this case before if i didn't it, it I, I love this case so so first let's start at the end um so here's a patient and the question is if you had this patient coming in and what pattern would you give this um patient comes in long-standing or just dyspnea no history shortness of breath and you came in with this pattern of fibrosis, what would you call it? Now, I mean, we could sit here and say it's a little atypical, it's this and that. Um, I don't personally see any honeycombing, but I would probably call this a, a typical or a, a possible UIP pattern. Um, yeah, there's some very, you know, stuff in the mid-lung zones, but that's just kind of how I would classify it. Agreed. What? I, I would yeah, I agree. Okay, I so let's... Chronic HP for that pattern. Yeah. And, and there, so let's go back um, now. I will say that unfortunately, I do not have a chest x-ray on this patient. I do have a shoulder exam, which doesn't help from a couple of years before, um, which was totally normal. She has x-rays on the outside. I'm trying to get hold of them that are completely normal from just like a few months before all this happened. So let's go back to her. So I showed you that CT from uh, July. Let's go to and she was normal in May. Let's go to a chest in April. Oops. Uh, so this is her, she came in shortness of breath on 419, had this abnormality, which is clearly, you're starting to have some volume loss. 
Uh, you're starting to have some reticulation here or whatever you want to call it. To me, it looks like some developing lung injury. Here is her CT from that time. So mm -hmm. developing DAD then has this a few weeks or a week later. Uh, da, da, da. Oop, that's sagittal. Sorry. Sorry, guys. And then here she is, DAD, fulminant DAD, and it heals. And let's see if I can uh, load these all. Um, I just think this is just a fascinating case. So this patient went from this one, let me find the last one, 422, 722. Yeah. This thing is being a pain. Let's see if I what these two are. So she went from DAD to a UIP possible UIP pattern of fibrosis, probably UIP pattern of fibrosis within three weeks or three months. She had her, her lungs were completely normal previously. Uh, so it's just interesting to think about these as. Now, I know we see a lot of DAD that does not deal with this, and I don't want to weird feedback there. Um, and there's a lot of DAD we know that heals with atypical patterns. Um, but I think it's just talking about how lung injury, that these patterns of fibrosis are due to lung injury. This one was a massive one, but presumably most cases of UIP are due to repetitive injury. This one just was a one-time, probably a one-time fulminant disease. She went up a, through a complete workup, nothing. She just developed DAD and now she has this permanent fibrosis. So did she get, did she get her dermatomyositis paddle and uh, everything, every, five, everything, everything, dude, MDA five. I'll have to check on all the specifics, but I, um, I don't think anything came back positive, but she's 72. Um, mm -hmm. she's never had any issues in her life. Like she's come, you know, ER couple, you know, chronic cough. She has a shoulder pain. She had an x-ray of her shoulder. She has her mammograms and that's it. Yeah. I mean, I'll check further to see if they've done any further workup. It's an older case. It's about four months old. Maybe, maybe she does have something um, okay. that popped up. It takes a while to get the MDA five back from the Mayo Clinic. The, um, you know, we, Sadaka showed me a case that looks a lot like this with rapidly progressive lung disease. It started out with a sort of NSIP slash organizing pneumonia pattern. And you had a little bit of perilobular disease here that could have been organizing pneumonia on the first scan that you showed. This is, uh, I think this is the first, let me see. Yeah, this is the first scan. Yeah, no, to me, this looks, yeah. I, I mean, I pathologically, we know there's going to be organizing pneumonia with these cases of DAD. Right. Um, we know that there, it organizes. So this is kind of the acute exudative phase and it's interesting pathologically you can see this too where you'll see one lobule that's just trashed and then the yeah. next lobule right next to it is fine it's very odd um yeah but uh yeah. so it's just i i i saw that i'm like oh that's just amazing and then oh that's your shoulder x-ray and then last case which is something i just never seen i know you guys have seen it i just haven't seen it this is someone with a um very nice Ex, uh, taken out, proven lymphatic malformation, and this is just showing her lungs, which show the nice uh, lamb. So this is we know that lymphatic malformations and lymphatic issues arise in people with lamb, and this is a um, patient with lamb who had a lymphangioma. I, I just had not seen that before. I know I know the I know of the association, it's just I hadn't seen it. Cool. Yeah, that's a big one. It is a big one. Uh, and I think it was like a small bowel lymphangia. I'm not even sure. Is it sporadic lamb or a TSC lamb? Uh, I have to look, but I think it was sporadic. She doesn't have any other signs of AMLs, but I'll have yeah. to look up her history exactly. Um, I don't see any little cardiac fatty deposits. I think she was sporadic. So that, yeah, that's, those are, uh, that's what I got. Cool. All right. Cool. Yes. All right. Uh, Peter, you want to go? You got your three? Sure. Three? Okay. Yep. Can you guys see the screen? The yep. CTs? 
Yeah, we see it. Okay. Okay. So this is a 56 year old patient uh, who has a very long history of coughing and hemoptysis. And um, this is his first CT when he came to our hospital from a few years ago. Um, as we scroll through, the main finding here is the cystic bronchiectasis. This kind of involves all lobes, but the most involved is the left lower lobe. A um, few other things to note here, no involvement of the trachea and then the main bronchi are also spared. It looks like it's kind of segmental, subsegmental involvement. Uh, the major causes of bronchiectasis in this case were ruled out. So no aspiration, um, immunodeficiency syndromes were also excluded. Um, and a ABPA was also excluded. Uh, so one of our uh, cardiothoracic surgeons actually recommended that the patient undergo a left lower lobectomy with the thought being that would just improve his quality of life. And the patient actually went ahead with that and he did significantly improve. Um, so when so when the lobe was taken out uh, in pathology, what was seen was um, a deficiency in bronchial cartilage. So the conclusion was that this was consistent with uh, Williams-Campbell syndrome. Um, and this I recently read his follow-up scan. So he's clinically doing much better. His follow-up scan is here. Um, not significantly, no, nothing significantly different other than the lobe being out. The other, the other cyst, uh, bronchic, bronchic cyst is still real and pretty much unchanged. And clinically is doing much better after the lobectomy. It's a nice case. That's really interesting. Yeah, because I think in Williams Campbell, they did have involvement of, I forget, something like the third through fifth generations of segmental bronchi. Yeah. And I, was, I was looking exactly. I was looking exactly for that, and it seems like uh, it's kind of midway through the lungs. You can see the the cystic change, the cystic bronchiectasis. But approximately, he's okay. And then the trachea seems completely uninvolved. Do you think that the uh, it, would, it would have been nice to have um, pathology of more normal bronchi, but they would it wouldn't be good for the patient to resect a more normal lung. Right, because yeah. I wonder if the cartilage deficiency was secondary to the chronic inflammation of the local bronchiectasis. So if you have bronchiectasis, you can start to digest your cartilage. Mm -hmm. And so is, is it, it, was that the underlying thing or was that acquired? Uh, so one wonders. It, it, it must be acquired because this gentleman was, uh, uh, or it must be a, a congenital thing because this gentleman was from, uh, originally from Eastern Europe from, uh, and then he, he moved to the U.S. in his 20s, but he said, and I was reading back through the chart, it said as, since he was, he was basically a teenager, he's been having like this really bad cough, and he thought he got it when he was serving in the military, but it seems like it might be something else, congenital, but it's been going, it's been going on for many years, but it does seem like the, they basically came up with this diagnosis as a, by exclusion, so not sure. Um, I can show another case. So this patient's a younger patient uh, in her mid thirties. She does have a immunodeficiency syndrome. She has CDID, and this is her first presentation um, in 2015 to our hospital. At the time, she was really short of breath. And uh, she has, as their CT, she has all these uh, bronchocentric nodules kind of diffuse everywhere. And at the time, this was uh, presumed multifocal infection. She started on antibiotics, uh, but unfortunately, didn't really improve. And then also, we don't have it. She she didn't follow up until 2018, so we don't have any intermediate scans. But this is what she look like when she came back in 2018. So symptoms hadn't really improved. Kind of a similar pattern, bronchocentric um, nodules everywhere. If you look carefully, there's some some architectural distortion, some organization, and then a little bit more um, consolidation and organizing changes here in the uh, posterior right upper lobe with some tr mild traction bronchiectasis. So at the time in 2018, she got a um, transbronchial biopsy and that showed Peter, is there lymphadenopathy and that looks as if there's a little um, right there. There is a little bit, yeah, subcrinal. 
Yeah, there's a bit. Is your spleen big? There's, where is her spleen? I don't see the spleen, actually. <laughs> well, Jeff, it's not big. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so on the, the transbronchial biopsy showed um, lymphocytic uh, infiltration uh, in the interstitium. No granulomas. But uh, we, she was presented at our uh, multidisciplinary conference and the diagnosis of GLD uh, was, was uh, made. Um, and she was started on prednisone initially and then switched to sirolimus. And this is what she looked like a few, a few uh, like uh, two weeks ago when I read her follow up. So all the nodularity is essentially resolved. Uh, maybe a little bit of scarring at the lung base is probably from the organizing organization that was seen on the prior scan, but also clinically doing much better. I know Howard showed a case of this a month or two ago. Um, I can show one last case. This is a case we saw recently. This is a 39-year-old um, gentleman, no past medical history, uh, but over the past month has been feeling um, feeling that well, uh, about a 10 pound weight loss. So he comes into our hospital about a week and a half ago and he's bacteremic. Um, his cultures grow out streptoc uh, streptococcus uh, oralis and he gets an echo. The echo is abnormal. Um, they see a bicuspid valve and um, they're worried obviously for endocarditis. They see some abnormality there. And so he gets a structural CTA which is abnormal. Uh, here's his aortic valve. So it's partially calcified, which would be consistent with the bicuspid valve. And then this, this soft tissue here in the valve is a large vegetation. Um, then he has these contour abnormalities of the, of the root, which are abscesses and actually a contained rupture. And um, the other thing is the soft tissue infiltration here uh, in the uh, aortomitral lint uh, curtain here. Looks like this abnormal soft tissue. It's causing mass effect in the left atrium, and it looks like it's enhancing. So um, we'll show also the uh, the cine. So essentially, this is uh, infective endocarditis, invasive actually, um, with vegetations. Wow. And then um, there's also, so this is the soft tissue on the, on the top left image. You can see the soft tissue, which is invaded between the uh, aorta, the aortic root and the left atrium. And um, uh, you can kind of, we can move it around. I can show the vegetation on the aortic valve, but I have it set right here. So you can also see the, uh, the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve is also perforated. Um, the top left image. So he underwent, um, this Monday actually, he underwent um, surgery and then they ended up doing what's called a commando uh, procedure where they, replace, they had to replace both valves and they had to uh, restructure his uh, intravalvular uh, fibrosa. So they had to repair that with the bovine patch. Um, I, a, I was gonna show. Looked up. This is a sh small, like, surgical doc article on the procedure, and then there's a little video. So you you get involvement of the valve, the aortomitral curtain through that to the mitral valve. Mm -hmm. or the exactly. Valve. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So the valve has vegetations, and then there's this. This is all uh, phlegmon and abscess here. And then also the mitral valve leaflet uh, is involved. It was a very complex uh, procedure. And then the, we looked up the, the mortality is 52% after that surgery. And uh, unfortunately, he's not doing great. It seems like uh, he already had one code after the surgery. And then he, he lost his kidney function. But we'll continue to follow him. Can you send us a link to that uh, particular article? That's really nice. I'd like to read sure, that. Sure, yeah. sure. And, it had, and it had a like a five minute video of um, the procedure. Excellent. Hey. Wow. Great case. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. That's it for me.
Howard, you ready? Okay. Okay, I'll show you this first case, which is um, a relatively young person that, and I don't know exactly how this evolved, but she has a nodule on chest radiography. And I'll show you what that looks like on CT. It's uh, smooth margins. It's interesting that it's got an area of focal, presumably maybe bronchiola or bronchial obstruction. I've not heard this term before, or I think I've heard it once before, but some people have described this phenomenon as an air gap sign, or where you have this lucency between the lesion and adjacent lung parenchyma. And I'm not really familiar with that, so that is interesting. Then it turned out that apparently she did report both flushing as well as diarrhea. And I couldn't read details about that, just, just that. So then what I think of course happened next is that they began to evaluate it. Uh, here is a conventional PET, FTG PET here that was done. And FTG shows that this is not particularly avid on FDG. But because of the flushing and diarrhea, undoubtedly, they were thinking of the carcinoid syndrome. So this is a PET dotatate scan, dotatate for the somatostatin receptors. And you can see that that is rather a dotatate avid. So because of that, they took this out. Now, if I remember correctly, it's unusual to have an actual carcinoid syndrome, those symptoms with a peripheral nodule carcinoid as opposed to a larger central bronchial carcinoid. But then the pathology turned out to be not a carcinoid and it turned out to be a sclerosing pneumocytoma. So it's not a carcinoid histologically under the microscope. And that's really interesting. So I have or had a article for you about a case report of a sclerosing pneumocytoma that was dotatate positive. So here's one. And in this particular article, uh, you see the nodule, you see they did a FDG and a dotatate scan. But this one too turned out to be a sclerosing pneumocytoma, not a carcinoid. So that's really interesting. So I don't know what it is about the pneumocytoma. It must have some receptors, obviously, somatostatin or something that takes up the dotatate. So I don't have time to kind of look that up, but I did find a case report of a dotatate positive pneumocytoma so-called, used to be called sclerosing hemangioma, but it's thought to be an epithelial lesion. Like this one, the lesion that we have so far now is TTF1 positive epithelial, and it's a CK something positive, also indicating an epithelial origin, not a vascular origin of the lesion. But I think it was, um, some of the neuroendocrine markers were negative, I think. So that's really interesting. So Howard, this uh, air gap sign goes with particular lesions. I've not heard about that one before. I'm not, but I, I do have another case report, which I don't have right now to show you, which was a collection of these lesions. I don't know how they collected so many, but they described the CT imaging features of a sclerosing pneumocytoma. And some of them had what they call this air gap sign. And I thought, no, I haven't heard about that. Have you guys heard about that? This lucency about a lesion? They saw some with a halo of opacity about the lesion, but they also showed a few examples, or at least one example of this focal, presumably air trapping, I don't know. I haven't, haven't seen that one in particular with the pneumocytoma, but I've seen 
two hamartomas that have this, I guess, air gap. I'd never heard that term before. Yeah, neither have I. I, I think I've read about it, but I thought it, I just chalked it all up to it's probably compressing the airway and causing a little air trapping, as you suggested. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll send you the other article that is uh, a summary of, of CT findings in a cohort of patients with this particular lesion, which is interesting. So it's still a puzzle to me about whether she really has substantial flushing and diarrhea, because now we have this pneumocytoma and there's a dissonance between that history that I, so it's still, it's still puzzling. The whole case is, is still puzzling to me. Maybe she has an abdominal carcinoid so been, I'll let you know. Maybe something's going to turn up, but right now, this whole thing's a bit odd. Okay, let me show you this other one. So this is a patient, a young patient with a history of sinusitis. Um, I'll show you some interesting findings on the CT. So the interesting findings are starting here. Look at the airways in the lungs. So starting here in the right upper lobe, superior segment of left lower lobe. Here we can see pathology in relation to airways. The bronchi are patent, but they're narrowed. And then as I go down, you'll see more of the same. So particularly here, look how abnormal the walls are of proximal generations of segmental bronchi with luminal narrowing. And in some areas we get nodular opacities where the process is related to segmental bronchi, more of the same and more of the same here and here and everywhere. So let's go back to the trachea and it actually looks okay to me looking for mural thickening. Um, maybe just ever so slightly but rather unimpressed by the appearance of the trachea. Mm -hmm. So he has substantial airway related opacities and he has lots of findings, both in terms of his clinical presentation and subsequent biopsies of GPA. So he's got the sinus disease, these lesions in the lung, findings consistent with that. And he's also got findings pretty consistent with GPA and the positive uh, kidney disease. So this is one of the more dramatic cases I have seen, I think, of segmental airway involvement rather than tracheo or main bronchus involvement with GPA. But I think we've shown cases like this before at the conference, maybe Jeff or, or Travis, I think, like this. Yeah, I, I think I showed a case, but you're much more likely to see tracheal involvement, but yeah, this is a great example of a more peripheral airway involvement. Yeah, pretty dramatic, huh? All right, those are my two cases, Jeff. Right. Thank you, Howard. Okay, let's see here. Okay, um, I'll start with this case. Let's get it loaded. All right, so this is a uh, patient. He, um, I think he's middle age. I can't remember exact age, but this was a trauma, and the history was he fell out of a tree stand. So he was uh, hunting and fell about 20 feet and he's got some rib fractures and stuff going on in the left lung. So I'll make this out of the way here. So, you know, a little bit of contusion and stuff there, but um, this is the first time I've seen this. I guess he fell far enough, but um, you know, typically falls aren't that um, big of a injury, but he has this little filling defect right here in the, uh, aortic isthmus, and I'll put it on a, on a multi-planar reformat here. Let's do this. Yeah. But this would qualify as um, an intimal tear, and it's, uh, so under 10 millimeters, and you know, we see it. Let's see if I can get it to scroll right to where I want it. It's mis There we go. So it's right here. I'll blow it up for everybody. But yeah, these um, these can occur. And these are probably ones we missed years ago when we didn't CT everybody for every little trauma. Um, but uh, the good news is, is they, um, they most of them go away. Actually, they all go away on their own. And the guidelines say, suggest 
follow-up is uh, optional. So uh, here they tend to follow them. So they did a CT then uh, 48 hours later, and you can see there's it's really gone. There's maybe a little. I still think there's a little little defect right there. Maybe it's maybe a little side branch vessel, but it's all gone there. So a minimal or intimal injury, which is now called intimal tear, no treatment um, other than just keep blood pressure reasonable, and they they resolve typically within a couple of days. Yeah. So I know you've shown several of those, Howard. Um, let's see. So here's a com companion case. So I sent this one a few couple of days. So this patient was transferred to us for a couple of reasons. She had uh, uh, just sort of cardiopulmonary decline. And uh, one of her diagnoses at the time of transfer was a type B aortic dissection based on this finding here at the aortic isthmus. And then this sort of ill-defined filling defect uh, extended down. She also has a lot of pulmonary embolism, which I think actually comes into play. Interesting, these pulmonary embolism, pulmonary emboli, not all of them look that acute. There's many eccentric ones. Uh, for example, in the left upper lobe, uh, let's see if we can get up there. You see it, it almost looks like mass as opposed to your acute PE. There's just a little sliver of contrast and not a lot of vasodilation. And she's got this mosaic attenuation that wasn't there a few months ago. So, I mean, they're, uh, so about, like about five months ago. So they're not necessarily uh, chronic, but I think they may be subacute. Uh, interestingly, if you look on her right heart, she's got um, RV dilation, right atrial dilation, and her left atrium is extremely underfilled, which brings me, and you can see her left ventricle is not very happy. It's being compressed. It's contracted there. But um, when I looked at this scan, was asked to look at the scan, I told the clinicians that this was not a dissection, but this was all a flow-related artifact. And you can see on the sagittal, and um, this is our smoke finding that uh, Travis helped uh, sort of, uh, well, Travis put that paper together, but you can see, um, and he came up with the term, but you can see this kind of wispiness there. It's, it's, it's not a nice dense filling defect. The other argument I made is the intimal calcifications didn't budge. And with the dissection of that much calcification around her aorta, you'd expect it to lift it off. And here you see the intimal calcification is intact. And this is all flow. This is all smoke. So uh, yep. real PE, but the reason why is I think it's an underfilled left atrium, therefore an underfilled left ventricle, um, and then decreased output, so sluggish flow in the aorta. So, so Jeff, yes, I think I think the distribution of this nicely shows the effect of uh, of a flow here when you have a a curved tube or a curved like river channel. Uh, yeah, the, 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 blood, the blood the blood flow goes out to the lateral edge to to the far edge. And the lesser curve is, you know, is where you get the turbulence and the under perfusion. So both of these artifacts here, the one you showed near the aortic arch and then the descending aorta are on the lesser curve. And that's right. where you're going to get the sluggish flow. Right. Uh, if, we, if we had a 4D flow MR, it would nicely illustrate that. We've seen that in some of the repaired congenital heart diseases where you can see the, the where you get turbulent flow. And you exactly, as David said, you see it along the lesser curve there. Yeah, so this was uh, up not being a dissection, but pulmonary embolism, which some of which is definitely not acute, but affecting left ventricular function. And it was important because she was actually on a beta blocker, uh, Esmolol, and they really wanted to get her off of it. So they were able to stop it because of that. Okay, uh, this is kind of an interesting case along the themes we've been talking about um, today. Uh, so this is a patient, I gotta get the times right here. Okay, so this patient uh, presented uh, back in 2018 for some uh, staging for a renal cell cancer, a uh, small renal cell cancer, and has this galaxy sign in the right upper lobe, and you see there's a little calcium in it. And this patient is of East Asian, uh, is actually an immigrant from, I believe, China, uh, and has that, and then this sort of fibrocalcific scar in the left lung apex. Uh, all a good look for tuberculosis, and whether or not it was active at that time was unclear. As far as I know, the patient had no known history of TB and the only exposure was a, a relative during childhood. Um, and so China has TB, but it's not a super high rate compared to some other countries. But a good look for TB may be an atypical sarcoid, but it really doesn't have the symmetry you'd expect of sarcoid. Uh, so patient uh, had nephrectomy and no issues with that and, and came back just for follow-up. And what's happened is this nodule in the left upper lobe has gotten bigger and it's now cavitated a little bit. And you can see some of the calcium's actually gone 
there is a much bigger chunk on the previous one that is now absent. I presume it is liquefied or been expectorated, uh, although she's not really producing any sputum. And so uh, this is uh, presumably reactivation TB being treated as such at this point. I don't think she ever received any treatment or she had limited treatment at the time. So Jeff, uh, what was the nephrectomy done? There was a tumor? A yeah, it was a, a, a small renal cell cancer. Yeah, it was localized uh, stage, like a T1 type stage one cancer. So, yeah. No chemotherapy is from what I can tell. So that's a reactivation, presumably a reactivation TB and with a lot of cavitation and a pre-existing lesion. And then this is a um, another case. This is a case of known tuberculosis. This is a 71-year-old. But I liked it because it was sort of an interesting uh, manifestation. Uh, we don't see a lot of TB, but you know, it has some inflammatory looking stuff, some, some nodules, ground glass stuff there that kind of centered around some airways. But then uh, down here had more of a mass in the lingula with some air bronchograms in it that you know we don't typically think about as TB, but TB of course can present as multiple masses. And then uh, I think, uh, yeah, had, had some airway stuff and then this big mass in the left lower lobe also associated with bronchiectasis. So, um, you know, when I see this, I think more of aspiration given the dependent stuff um, or, um, you know, maybe MAC, but uh, this was a, this is actually MTB. And I came across the CT because I, I had a, an, a hard copy outside radiograph of the follow-up just following treatment. Here's the, so Jeff, Jeff yeah. was, there right, was there right airway narrowing too? Because it looks as if there could yeah. be some bronchiectasis. Yeah, right in there. Let's go back to the axials. There's some thin cuts. Yeah, so there's the upper lobe, bronchus intermedius. Yeah, it is a little narrowed in there, isn't it? Uh huh. Yeah. And then there is the subcranial lymph nodes and calcium in it. Yeah. So, you know, we don't see a lot of TB. So, it, but it can it can mimic a lot of things. And this is just the less typical to get in these large mass-like areas of consolidation. Interesting, it preserved the airways. I think of TB as often taking out or at least incorporating the airways, cavitating into them. Hmm. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Talk to you next Thank week. Thank you. All right, bye. All right, later, guys. Bye.